we pull everything up. Okay, so we're really pleased to have Vincent Verway presenting to us this evening on tree ID skills. Take it away, Vincent. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, is this coming through well? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Vincent Ferrey. I'm the Arlington County Urban Forest Manager. And as Nora mentioned, we, I supervise the forestry section. Um, and I've uh, been teaching winter tree ID or tree ID for uh, about 10 years for the tree stewards, either informally or more formally through this. And uh, it's, it's one of those uh, things I really enjoy because um, the controversy with winter tree ID tends to be a lot less than with uh, trees and development or things like that or budget or things like that. So <laughs> a little bit more enjoyable on my side. Um, and I get a lot of joy out of um, identifying trees in winter. It's, it's a little bit of a party trick when you're uh, uh, walking around with your friends and you're just pointing at trees left and right and like oh, that's a sugar maple that's a beach and they are like well I, of course that's a beach that's an easy one and then you pull out the really good identification and that's a pin oak and I bet you didn't know that um, <laughs> and it's not just in winter where you can use these I, I teach winter tree id because it's really the best way to learn uh, how how to identify trees um of course, leaves are uh, usually what people look at, but if you can identify something without looking at its leaves, you're gonna be much faster at it. You're also gonna learn an appreciation for things that are not leaves. Um, the bark and buds and uh, just the shape of trees is really uh, just kind of fascinating to look at. And uh, I get a lot of value out of that. So I've, uh, during the pandemic, I've acquired this skill of being able to present and look at the chat in, um, in, in Zoom. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go forward and present my presentation. Um, and if you have questions, just put them in the chat and I'll try to, try to keep an eye on it. Uh, I was talking to Nora before this presentation saying that I'm, uh, I'm what's now called a geriatric millennial, but I was an early adopted adopter of, of uh, computers and, uh, and I've managed to be pretty adept at looking at multiple things at the same time. But if you don't have questions, I'll just uh, truck along and show you different skills you can use. And I'll see you at the, uh, the 20, the, on the 26th as well. And we can apply some of these skills in the field. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So let's see if I can ad advance this. Okay. So what do you need for a tree identification? Um, your senses and uh, the obvious is sight. Um, touch is actually a remarkably good tree ID skill. Some, some things, some bark is spongy or can be really, or twigs can be more or less flexible. Smell can be use, useful, um, especially with things like black cherries, which you can scratch the twigs and get kind of an almond smell. And uh, taste is usually the last thing to identify something with, but you might be able to uh, figure out the difference between different persimmons or something or different pears by taste. But just like with uh, hunting for mushrooms, make sure you know what you're eating before you're putting it in your mouth. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> then uh, you might have gotten some information like uh, dichotomic, dichotomous keys, and you might have some field guides for tree identification already, either through the tree steward class or because you're already uh, passionate about trees, you might already have some books. Um, I get a lot of value out of the uh, City of Trees field guide. Uh, this is by Melanie Bradley. Um, and one of the value of that is that that is a field guide written just for Washington, D.C. And because we're basically uh, Washington, D.C., uh, ecologically and culturally uh, in Arlington County, we, uh, we share pretty much all the uh, species in that field guide. So if you want a really local field guide, it's a, it's a thick book and it has a lot of history um, of species and, and where to find them, too, which is really fascinating. Um, I, it doesn't have, it doesn't have uh, photos in it, but it does have drawings. Um, and I, I get a lot of value out of those, but I have, I would say that um, pictures are usually 
if you're if you're more of a visual person than a than a descriptive person, I would go for some of the um, uh, like the Audubon guide um, to uh, get also get a reference for uh, what the actual bark and leaves look like. Uh, and I can I can put some of those in, uh, in in the chat later on if we have some time. On which guides I I find particularly valuable. Um, you can especially in the in the winter if you can get to it a, a hand lens can be really helpful for looking really up close to, at buds. Sometimes with things like uh, green or white ash, it's hard to tell which species it is, and you have to really look at the bud scar with a hand lens or with just really good eyes. And then one one thing I tell everybody is that I don't trust my memory, but uh, it is pretty good with trees. But um, a good memory is reinforced by repetition and by uh, trying things out again and again. Um, it usually takes me about 100 times seeing a tree to really get a feel of that particular species. I'm still a little bit rough on, on hickories and a couple other things. Um, so I'm, I'm at about 150 species now that I can identify pretty quickly, but there's still more to go. And then I, I go to Costa Rica and I'm totally confused. Uh, um, that's uh, always, always fun to find new places and find new, uh, new trees to discover. Um, if you're working with a tree that you have, uh, have ownership of or work or have the capacity to kind of cut a piece off to identify it, you can use a sharp knife or clippers, or if you ask a forester, you could do that if you really needed to identify something in our parks. Uh, but we can probably help you figure out what something is too. Um, so pattern recognition is very helpful and I'll get into that a little bit. Attention to detail, particularly in the winter. And then memory, I said memory was good. Did you remember that? All right, okay. So how do we identify trees in winter? We use all the parts. So in, in summer and uh, spring and fall, you're probably gonna be just distracted by the leaves, just not even looking at the bark or anything else. Um, but in the winter, you have to really work with what you've got. Uh, look at the bark, look at the twigs, look at what, what's left over from flowers or, or fruit, look at thorns or other kind of things that might give a good identifier. And look at the shape of the tree. Um, really like if you have the chance stand back from the tree and um sh and really look at just what the overall shape of the tree is that can tell you a lot so especially with open grown trees trees that don't have a lot of competition from other trees um, they may um, actually show their their ultimate shape in a much better way uh, so you can get pyramidal trees or circular or globular trees and i'll get into that as well and look at where the tree is growing. Look at the location. In a natural setting, you can learn a lot about whether you're closer to a stream or farther up a ridge. Um, certain species just don't grow near wet, wet areas and certain species just don't grow in really dry areas. So looking at the location can really help you uh, try to narrow down your selection. And ultimately this is kind of like a narrowing down uh, exercise. First you're like, okay, well, it's a tree. And then through a dichotomous key, you go, well, is it evergreen or, or, uh, or is it uh, deciduous? Uh, do you see leaves in certain arrangement or do you see buds in certain arrangement? And you just kind of narrow it down more and more until you hopefully get down to species. But if you don't get down to species, you really can be, just don't, don't, don't feel bad about getting it down to a genus level. So if you know it's an ash, and you just don't, you don't have the time or you don't have the capacity or the knowledge yet to identify beyond that, then don't feel bad about just saying, hey, it's an ash, I'll figure it out later. Um, or you won't figure it out. <laughs> That's totally fine too. Um, and uh, and, and uh, maybe you'll learn something in the future and, and you'll be like, oh, I think I figured out that's a green ash because it was closer to the stream and it had this capacity, this, this bud scar. And uh, then you can update your eye naturalist or just your mental history of, of what you were looking at. And then looking at debris around the, uh, uh, around the tree, this can be a little bit deceptive because um, trees drop debris near other trees and you might be looking at an acorn of a different tree um, that dropped near the tree you're trying to identify. So make sure it came 
from the tree that you're trying to identify. Uh, you can usually see the remnants of um, the fruits or, or flowers on the existing part of the tree. And then practice, go out into your woods or even along street trees are very easy to identify, or easier to identify because you can usually go around them and see all sides of them um, and practice, practice your identification skills. So we're gonna start with bark. And this is where our field gets get really poetic and weird. And our terminology can be a little bit subjective. Um, so uh, this is where descriptive terms like smooth, scaly, ridged, furrowed, fissured, platy, blocky, netted, and more come in. And this is where I, I think it's almost more beneficial for you to kind of de de develop your own terms. You can use these. And if something says ridged, then it might mean something between different people. Um, hold on for one second. Let me close my door for a second. Get some noise here. All right, I'm back. Um, Okay, so let's look at some, what people have described this bark as um, uh, in different trees. So um, this is hard to do with uh, a, a, a virtual class a little bit, but um, if uh, people want to, uh, I'll give a moment to uh, have people just write in the chat how they would describe this bark. So I'll give it maybe like 30 seconds for people to write this up. Okay. Well, getting some pretty uh, consistent <laughs> messages here. Messy, thin and gray, horizontal fissures, light colors. I, a lot of notes that it's smooth or smooth-ish, smooth gray fissures, yep. Is that, there, there, there's no wrong answer here. This is just you trying to describe what this bark looks to your, to you. Well, there might be like, I wouldn't call this blocky or, or, or uh, like scaly, for example. Grainy, yeah, you're looking at the texture of the color. It can be kind of like it's, it's stretched a little bit. So here's another one. So I'm gonna give, go through a couple of these and I'm not actually giving you answers because it, there's just, there are a couple of several answers. So here, blocky, scaly, crusty. Yeah. Rough, that's a good description too. Smooth versus rough, that, that can break up. And then you're definitely probably not looking at a beech tree. Okay. All right, here's another one. What's, a, what, what's the identifying feature here to you? Netted, ridged. Okay. Diamond fissures. There we go. Thanks, Mario. Furrows, netted. Yep. Yeah, the diamond thing. That's a real. That's a really good one in this situation. You can see these diamonds in here. Sinewy is really good. Uh, there's a lot of. Um, there's there are trees like muscle wood. I mean, the name has has it in the name. Um, that and it really describes things that are on human anatomy too. Ropey, that's an interesting one. Cool. All right, this one's actually, this one is of a tree that describes its bark. Shaggy, that's right. Exfoliating, yeah, that's a good one. So it's not a sycamore, but it's a, a kind of, a, a, that's a good description for a sycamore too. Loose, peeling, yep. Great answers, everyone. Yep. All right, and this one I actually give away, shag bark hickory. Not a surprise here with that with that bark. It's a, it's a tree that's native of maybe like 50 to 100 miles from here, but uh, there's a couple in the county that have been planted. Um, really cool tree. Um, people make shag bark hickory syrup off of the, by, by baking syrup with the bark. And the nuts are very tasty for hickories. Uh, the only thing that beats it is probably pecan trees. All right, I got another one. This one's uh, 
This one I'll give you the identification too, but this one's uh, got some distinctive bark too. Peeling, yep. Do you feel like if you pulled on that, that you could actually pull that off though? Like, is it platey? Yeah. It's got these like separating plates. Oh, wavy rolls. Yeah, describe it like you would do a, an English bulldog. <laughs> um, yeah. So this one, um, I think it gives it away too. When you look at, there's another identifying feature here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give this, give people a chance to actually identify this based on these two identifying features. So yeah, you've got these huge thorns. And if you've ever been to the, the horse stables near um, in Rock Creek Park, horses rub up against these trees and they create these thorns that are just lethal um, in the places where they get rubbed. I've got two answers. I'm going to give it a give people a chance to give me another couple answers, or give give me a, give people maybe just twenty seconds to give uh, some other thoughts. Thorny locust. English bulldog. All right, locust, honey locust, hawthorn. All right, yeah, I've got I've got the right answer in here already. So I've got honey locust, locust. You, you do want to specify if you're looking at a black locust or a honey locust, but they're very related. They're both in the bean family. And you've got these massive thorns. Apparently, they were used by Native Americans as, uh, as darning needles. So that's how big they are. And just because you feel like you've identified it, sometimes nature doesn't behave. Uh, the, the two top trees um, those are that's a uh, sweet gum and a hackberry look very much alike with this warty bark. Warty is another really good description for some of these trees when they're young, and then they look nothing alike when they're older. Um, and uh, so, so sometimes it's also good to to memorize the uh, or not memorize. Know that there's a lot of uh, change over time with these trees. So you've got sweet gum and hackberry. Very unrelated, but when they're young, they look very similar with the warty bark. All right, and then looking looking at twig characteristics too. Um, so this is when you can't quite figure something out from the bark. Like you, we, I gave you some easy ones, and uh, not even the easiest one that wasn't even in there: the American beech or the sycamore. Um, but sometimes you need to go a little bit farther, and you need to look at a uh, at a twig for uh, identifying features. So where, where are the buds? Is there a terminal bud? Is there a cluster of terminal buds like with oak trees? Are there lentil cells, these little tiny dots along the, along the twig? What does the lateral bud look like? What does the scar, the leaf scar look like? So the, the leaf came off of this area over here um, and, uh, and leaves behind this uh, leaf scar, scar underneath the bud usually. And it can tell you a lot, like sometimes it's heart-shaped or uh, spade-shaped or rounded, or it surrounds the entire bud. And that can often give you a pretty good identifying feature. And I would say that a, most, a lot of trees you could identify by bud alone. Um, but usually you don't have to. But if you can get to the twig, you can get really far with, uh, with tree identification. Oak trees might be a little bit difficult by buds alone, but at least you would be able to distinguish between a sycamore and a maple with that. So I'm going to look at some buds and I'm going to give the answers to these too. Uh, so this is this is advanced bud identification, but I'm going to give people the chance to see if somebody knows what this is. So it's often described as a duckbill bud, but uh, the name has nothing to do with ducks. So uh, Anybody know it? I'll give it a little bit. Callie Brown, you're you're wading into the deep with the, with your answers here. Tulip tree, tulip tree, tulip tree. All right. Well, I hate to say that, but that's not the answer, and that's totally fine that we didn't get that. Sometimes uh, this is not the most the most common tree. Um, dogwood. Um, 
Dogwoods would be oppositely arranged. Um, really cool shrub, but uh, this one's a this one's a, a wacky one. This is a our tree with the biggest native fruit um, on this continent, actually, and uh, really cool cool little tree. Kind of looks tropical when you find it, but uh, if, in the in the winter they're actually fairly easy to identify because they kind of grow in little groups in our forest too. So yeah, this is pawpaw. Yeah, a paintbrush is a good descri description too. Yeah, duckbill, paintbrush, whatever makes it stick in your mind that, hey, if a, if it's a paintbrush that makes you think of uh, uh, pawpaw because it starts with P, that's a good way to remember it. So this is a good description. These pictures are a good description of an entire group or an entire genus of trees. Um, and this is a really good picture of something showing uh, a group of terminal buds. So uh, thanks, Joe, you've got the answer already. So this is, um, this is a very easy identifier for oak trees. So you can at least get to oak when you get to um, the, the terminal bud. Usually you also see acorns around, but they're not always there. So um, this having a, a cluster of terminal buds at the end of the twig is a really good tell. Sometimes you'll see a twig with just one bud, and that can be a lot of things, but if it's a cluster, three, four, five buds, you're very likely looking at an oak tree. So they have already limited it to just like 10, 15 oak trees, oak tree species it could be. And that might still be daunting because oaks are hard to identify, but you've gotten really far, and uh, you've probably gotten farther than most people if you get to this point. Yep, Quercus. So not going to identify all of these. Well, I can, but um, you can see just looking at the variety here, you've got so many things to look at when you're just looking at buds. You've got these larger buds uh, with really big bud scars. You've got these gigantic buds. This is a devil's walking stick. The reason it's so big, it's because um, it's holding a leaf that is tripinnate, meaning that it's a leaf that splits once then splits again and splits again into multiple leaflets. It's really cool. It's a, it's more of a shrub than a tree, but it's got these huge buds. Um, <laughs> Mariel, that's a, it's actually funny you mentioned the ginkgo because it also kind of stacks the buds like that, but it's more straight out from the trunk than, 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 uh, than rounded like this with, uh, um, with the, um, sorry, the, uh, uh, devil's walking stick. Sometimes you have tiny little buds like these um, these red bud buds, and uh, you can get a lot of out of these different ones. Yep, you got it. The one on the right is red bud. You got this zigzag thing. I'm gonna give you the tools to identify most of the major trees, just so you know. We're not gonna just do these guessing games over here. Flower buds are different from leaf buds, so keep that in mind. And there were some leaf buds in this picture, but this is this is really focusing on flower buds. And you can get a lot of out of it, right? Especially right now when dogwood buds are just like so ready to burst for the spring and just go and show off. Red buds are also like getting really close to bursting out their flowers, and you can just identify trees based on that. The, the flowering dogwood is our state tree. And uh, you can just pop and pick them out of the landscape just by looking at these, these uh, buds ready to go. Uh, I've got some more unusual things like spice bush. And keep in mind that some flowers are not showy like this birch flower, it's sideways, so it's a little silly, but this birch flower can already be out uh, along with the alder flowers. And they can actually be really cool when you look up close. Alder flowers are are these catkins that are very bright red when they're first coming out for the winter and they can be really neat to look at. And then you gotta give them a little tweak to let them go if they're pollen so, and uh, get some other joy out of it. So this is a little bit of extreme of a picture, but these are some pictures I took of uh, trees that are growing an unusual habitat. And, I, and there's obviously uh, more simple habitats that we look at, but we really have to look at where a tree is growing. So if a tree is growing in the, in the middle of the woods, um, surrounded by other trees uh, high up on a ridge, it's probably more dry. Um, and Bill even identified where, where that tree on the left was growing, good one. Um, 
and Kathy identified where the tree on the right was growing. Very nice. <laughs> you guys are just trying to show me up now. Um, so looking at what kind of environment they're growing in and what they're able to tolerate is, is going to limit what types of trees you have. Um, and these are not good examples for our, our, our environment, uh, but it just, just think about when you're looking at trees in a natural environment, where are they growing uh, and what trees would be able to handle that. So if your field guide says can handle marginal sites or dry sites or low nutrient sites, it can probably be one of these kind of these pine species like the one on the right. Although this one's cheating a little bit, it's got a root that goes out to the mainland that's probably sucking up nutrients and water. So it's like, I wonder if, what happens if you were to cut that off, it would probably make the tree die, but it's still really impressive that this tree had all of its soil eroded around it. Anyway, a little bit of tree showing off. The tree's showing off, not me. <laughs> but uh, both of you were right, Anchor Wat and Lake Superior on these locations. Um, okay, I'm not going to go into location too much because that gets really into it. But I, with these individual trees, I'll talk a little bit about what habitats they're common in. So this is a list of the majority of the trees that you'll see either in the natural environment or in, um, in cultivated environments. So these are not all native trees. In fact, some of them are invasive trees like Atlantis. Um, some of them are non-native, non-invasive trees like Don Redwood. Um, and I've left some out. So the ones that are not bolded are much less common, uh, but I'm happy to talk about them. And we've already actually gotten a little bit of a hint on pawpaw. I'm happy to talk about how to identify these. Some of them are also really easy, like Catalpa is really easy to tell. But we're going to go through all the all the trees that are in bold. And um, I'm, I'm going to try to talk about all the identifying features of them. And obviously, this is getting recorded. And then the presentation will be posted, too. So you can kind of use this presentation as a field guide for most of the common species in Arlington and Alexandria and DC and the surrounding area. So starting with some of, one of the most common uh, landscape species is the, the maple group. So we've got, um, and I've got these in Latin names and I'm doing that intentionally. We really should try to stick to Latin names. Uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't ever use uh, common names. Obviously people in the chat, you're, you're more familiar with using the common names. That's totally fine. That's what we, we foresters do too. We're not talking about Quercus rubra all the time. We're gonna say a red oak something like that. But when we have to get specific, we get into the Latin names. So we've got Acer, that's the genus. And then Nagundo, that's the box elder. Rubrum is the red maple. Saccharum is the sugar maple. And then confusingly, Saccharinum is the silver maple. So a little bit of a, 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 a dyslexia trip up over here, unfortunately. Um, and uh, I've, had, I've had to take some time to uh, <laughs> get used to that too. So how do you identify a maple? So getting to maple level, well, you're only gonna get four, mostly four species. There's rarely you'll see a, a paper bark maple plant planted, but that, that, that's extremely rare. So these species, the ones that you'll see around are one thing that's very critical about this is op they're all opposite. And there's no exception for that in Acer so in, or, or in Maple. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sure you've gotten into this uh, before about opposite versus alternate, but I'll do a recap throughout this. So um, if you're not familiar, if you, if you haven't remembered the madcap horse um, rule that you can use, Maple, Ash, Dogwood, Caprifoliaceae, which is um, the uh, honeysuckle family, and horse chestnut are all opposite. So these are uh, trees with um, buds or twigs or flowers that come out of the same location. You can really see this, it's very regular, even on the same location. And they'll, they'll do that in their branching and everything else too. Sometimes you'll get an alternately arranged tree and the, the, every once in a while an alternate arranged tree has an opposite um, point, but then they'll be alternate almost everywhere else. So it's opposite. So we've already gotten it down to that madcap horse group. Um, 
most maples have flaking or cracked bark. Uh, this one's a little bit more, more crusty, like a, like a bread crust almost. They have clustered buds, buds that come together, um, but not usually like, a, like an oak tree has, has kind of alternating buds at the end. So uh, that doesn't really look the same as uh, an oak tree. Um, and oak trees are alternate, not opposite. So that's an easy di distinguishing feature. They have, uh, they're usually large, large canopy, very spread out. They live near streams. And here's, a, here's an uh, unusual identifying feature, a sooty mold. Uh, so in, in urban environments, you'll often get um, trees that have been pruned or have some kind of wood wound, and they'll be uh, leaking um, sap on the tree. And that gets eaten by aphids and then also creates this mold that kind of creates an effect of of burning almost. It looks like the tree is burning. And that's a, that's a rare identification, but you do see it. Uh, you can, I can see it throughout Arlington County, particularly with our street trees. So um, you might see a darker tree and I'm like, what, what is that? Normally it would be silver in a natural environment, but it's gained this mold and it's not really harmful to the tree, but it doesn't really help it either. So, and it kind of just lives along with it. Tree of Heaven. So this is actually this is our one of our most invasive trees in Arlington County. Um, has very smooth bark, uh, slightly bumpy, but not very bumpy. Uh, has huge bud scars, like the the size of your thumb almost. That's a very good identifier. Uh, it usually lives in invaded habitat, meaning like uh, back alleys or unmaintained parks sections or. Um, railroads or thing, things like that. It's the tree that um, was featured in the tree that grows in Brooklyn, um, which was in that book, it's really seen as like something that can survive a tough environment, which it can. Um, and uh, the bark and twigs, when you scratch them or even when you break them off, they smell like rancid peanut butter. Um, and that's that's it smells bad whether you think it smells like rancid peanut butter or not. It just smells bad, really like kind of a strong, um, acrid smell. So that's a really good identifier. But this giant bud and this gray bark is a, is a pretty good identifier in general. Um, the group of service berries. This is a very commonly planted smaller uh, ornamental tree. It's got these. Um, uh, so we've got uh, the uh, downy service berry and several other service berries. I haven't memorized all these names, but we've got, I think, downy Canada and shadblow service berry um, that are commonly planted in our environment. They're a native tree. Uh, and what I, this is a little bit of an unusual way of describing it, but I like to describe it as a tree that has stretch marks. Um, it really has like this smooth bark that uh, feels like it has been stretched over time and discolored over time. Sometimes also has, has a lot of lichen on it. For some reason, lichen really like um, attaching themselves to this, this particular tree. So that might be an identifying feature too. And then it often gets this thing called cedar apple rust, which looks like this on the, on the top right which is um, like a, it's an infection of the fruit. Doesn't really harm the tree that much, but it creates this weird like alien looking fruits that makes the fruit inedible, which is unfortunate because pretty much all the service berries are edible and you can make a fantastic pie or jelly out of them. Um, they're very small trees, but you've got this smooth bark. Uh, the, the buds are nothing to write home to about. So if you compare it to this, you've got smooth gray bark and smooth gray bark, but not that giant bud scar, not the rancid peanut butter. You just kind of exclude it from the other options. Birch, this is probably one of the easier ones that you see. Um, it's mostly our uh, native uh, river birch, which is very common in the, in the landscape. Uh, people plant them in these like triple trunked fashions pretty much everywhere. That's not necessarily the natural way that they always grow, but that's how they're sold. That's how people expect them to look sometimes. Uh, so in the la in landscape uh, areas, you'll see them like this, and we'll see them at Barcroft too. They've got this flaky bark, uh, or in the case of the paper birch, this really bright white uh, 
bark when they're younger. Now this one really is a little bit confusing. With, so when, when it gets older, like maybe 20, 24 inches larger, it starts losing some of these features. So when it's older, and I'll show you one of those at Barcraft too, it starts to kind of lose those features and starts to look a little bit more like a black cherry, a little bit lighter, but a little bit more like that. And it's natural environment that really lives well along streams. So we'll see the long four mile run, uh, but uh, you've seen it almost, you see it almost more commonly in a landscape than you do in, uh, in the natural environment. So this is another location-based thing. It's like, well, it's planted in a landscape and it's got this papery, like uh, you, you can actually pull this, this stuff off and, and draw it, but this kind of papery uh, bark, it's probably a river birch or a birch at very least. And then you can easily uh, narrow it down just based on what are native or common landscape plants here. Hornbeam. So I talked a little bit about um, comparing things to like your your own body. So this is also known as the um, the muscle wood, um, muscle wood or iron wood. Um, so you can kind of see that sinewy muscle look at the bottom right, um, and that can be a really good identifier. Um, and it's also, I think it's useful to use muscle wood because there's like five species of trees that are called ironwood and they're all completely different trees. So I'd like to have there be less confusion, but the more official name for it is hornbeam. So there's an American hornbeam, which is a little bit more irregular looking. And then there's the European hornbeam, which has been cultivated a lot to look at like these kind of flame-like shapes. And the European hornbeam has been cultivated like this for for hedges mostly most mostly so they often get shaved into head shapes and they can take a lot of abuse um, so if you see a hedge of a deciduous tree it's often going to be something like a hornbeam but um, you're you're going to see the the native species in the along stream sides and a little bit farther up from the stream um, and uh, and with this extremely sinewy bark, but both of them have the sinewy bark. They're just, you're gonna find them in different places. You're not gonna find a European one in a natural environment. They don't tend to escape. So uh, this is honestly like one of those trees where you're like, you just need the bark. You just need to look at this weird sinewy thing and then you're, you're pretty much done. That's all you need to know. They are smaller trees so uh, too. So if you see a giant tree with this sinewy bark, it's probably like a beech or something like that. All right, hickory. We talked a little bit about shagbark hickory, which you can see here, that's the easy identifier, easily identified one. Um, the other ones are a little bit diff more difficult. They're, uh, they're related to oak trees and they sometimes have a very oak looking uh, bark and sometimes a very nondescript bark. They kind of like have that stretch mark thing going on that the surface berry had but um, then it'll be a different branch on the same tree will look more like this. So that's not very useful in this. So how do we identify uh, hickory trees? Well, they've got giant buds uh, on their tree and they are alternate. So they're gonna be, you see how these buds are arranged alternately. They're not opposite from each other. So <clears throat> there's only one other tree that it could be with a, a bud that size, and that's the sweet gum. Uh, and these are fuzzy buds. Sweet gums are sticky buds. Um, um, hickories are much fuzzier and, and kind of uh, kind of like a like a look a, a tulip that's about to bloom. Um, then the other thing you can probably see is is just leftover hickory nuts. They stay around for a while. Usually there's some hickory nuts that have been eaten by insects that the squirrels don't want anymore. Uh, or you'll still see some of the shells of hickory nuts saying, laying around. You mostly see these in a natural environment. So um, um, you're probably not gonna see them in somebody's front yard. So if, you, uh, if you're in a forest, you're gonna see them. It's unlikely to see it in like downtown Roslyn or something like that, uh, except for maybe in some of the, na the small natural parks. So we've got a bunch of species and I, I, I it's hard to tell some of these apart, except for Illinoensis, which is the, the pecan tree, which is commonly planted around here, and Ovada, which is the shagbark hickory. Those are pretty easy to tell apart. The pecan has pecan seeds that look like pecans, 
and the shag bark hept is shaggy bark. Um, and uh, the other ones are the bitter nut, pig nut, and um, mocker nut, which are very similar looking. So you might need some uh, deeper ID. Francis, you asked, define large and small trees, overstory and understory. Yeah, that's, um, so what, what's a large tree? So something that can get to like an oak size or a beach size, usually 30, 40 foot or larger, tends to get to 24 inches in diameter or larger. Um, you're gonna find uh, large canopy trees in the understory, but eventually they're going to be growing into large trees if they get the access in the sunlight. And some of these smaller trees like the hornbeam is just always gonna stay small. It's always gonna be like maybe 25 feet at most, uh, but it's gonna look like it's definitely a mature tree. Mariel, you asked why don't people plant hickories? Um, they're really hard to transplant. They have this tap root that uh, develops really early on in their life. And uh, they can be very difficult for nurseries to grow and have survive. Uh, some people have figured it out. So uh, we're slowly starting to see some larger hickories in the, in the industry. But most of the time, you have to plant them with a really small, like three feet tall, and maybe just a little whip. So that's hard to keep alive in an urban landscape. Um, but um, they're very rewarding. I, I planted one in a community, community garden and it's just tough as nails. Uh, so we're looking at some of these and seeing if we can put them in our streetscape in some test areas. So it's just hard to grow, that's why. But they're great trees and very, apparently also very climate change resilient. So we're gonna keep looking at this species. All right. Hackberry, I've already given you one of these identifying features of the hackberry, and that's the warty bark. Um, and that's why there's so few other identifying features, because if you have the warty bark, it's one of two species. It's a hackberry or it's a sweet gum. And I talked about this giant bud on the, heck, on the, on the hickory. The sweet gum, I'm, getting, I'm probably confusing you now. The sweet gum has a giant bud as well, but the hackberry does not. So this is warty bark, very small buds. You, I mean, I don't even have a picture of them. They're hard to uh, get a good picture of. Um, uh, so not these giant, like almost inch long buds. And they might have these remnants uh, uh, fruits left on the tree too. They're, these are actually edible. They're not, they have a really big pit in them, but they kind of taste like raisins, um, really cool fruit. Uh, so the fruit might be left behind. We've got this warty bark. And then the tree looks very uneven. It doesn't, it, it looks like it doesn't know where it's going. It's like, oh, this will be the main trunk. Oh no, this will be the main trunk. Ah, oh, no, let's do this one. So it's very, uh, it's, it's indecisive is a good way of describing uh, hackberries. Um, but they're also very adaptive to different changes to, in the environment. Uh, so we've got a common hackberry and then um, well, we have one more, but uh, we have the common hackberry and the sugar hackberry. And then there's technically another one called the dwarf hackberry, which we have a couple of, and we actually have the national champion dwarf hackberry, which always makes people giggle because it's like, okay, well, it's a national champion dwarf. So how big is it? Well, it can fit in the screen of my Zoom presentation. This is how big the trunk is. It's not very impressive looking, but for its species, it's the largest of its, uh, of its kind. And that one's living in uh, Arlington Cemetery. Red buds. Okay, I think this one might be one of the easier ones. Um, you've got, uh, it's a smaller tree. It's got this stripped flaky bark, especially later in life. And then it's got a zigzag um, twig too, which I don't know why I didn't describe this in here, but it also gives it that uneven form. You can see it in this picture on the bottom left where it, uh, the twig is just zigzagging left and right. And um, that's a really good identifying feature. And it also causes, and th that feature unfortunately causes the tree not to live very long because it's, you can see it in the larger scale of, the, of its branches. And that doesn't allow for a lot of structural support for these, um, these, uh, these small little limbs over here. So it's never gonna grow to like a large oak tree. Um, if you ever wanna learn a, a fun kind of cultural background, look up the Judas tree um, 
with uh, uh, that, uh, there's a good story by Alonzo Abogados, our natural resource manager, who talks about some of the, the myths around why it was suddenly made into a small tree, which is really cool. Uh, Nora mentioned uh, that this tree is Colliflorus. Yeah, this is this is definitely more something for later in the in the spring. But it is cool to see when the when the the flowers come out. And I showed the flowers earlier. They come up like uh, they come right out of the bark. Um, they just kind of just show up. There's no twig. There's no uh, no peduncle or anything else that the 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 flowers are attached to. They just kind of poof, just straight off the bark. It's really cool. That's a nice, uh, I like that word too, cauliflorus. All right. Um, I'm gonna do a couple more of these and then I'm gonna take a quick break if that's okay and, uh, and uh, recharge my voice and, uh, and come back. But I'm gonna do a couple more and then uh, we're gonna keep going. So dogwood was mentioned earlier and uh, this is a fairly easy identifier by this by the buds. So we have um, uh, alternate leaf dogwood, which is the only exception to dogwoods being opposite. Flowering dogwood, which is our state tree, which has these big buds. Kusa dogwood, which has kind of pointy buds, but still opposite. And Kusa dogwood has this camo looking um, bark, which is a real good identifier, almost like a sycamore, but then everything else is different than a sycamore. Um, and then some of the less uh, planted ones like the Cornelian shag or the, the red twig dogwood, which is more of a shrub, but I'm still showing it here. Um, these are hard to misidentify. The buds usually give it away. Sometimes you can look at the bark and identify it from that, but you're gonna see the buds or leaves or flowers and get these pr pretty quickly. Um, they're very uneven. I don't have a, a picture of the, the shape of the tree here, but it's not this similar from the red bud. It kind of looks like that too, but um, it's an opposite, uh, very distinct buds um, and a common landscape tree for all of these. So you'll see them in landscapes and in natural areas. All right, persimmons. Uh, you might still see some of the fruit hanging onto trees of persimmons and we'll see those in in Barcroft too, when we walk, walk through there. Um, these are, this that we have a native persimmon, the, the Diosporus virginiana. And then we have, uh, we, we sometimes see the Diosporus khaki, which is the, uh, the Japanese or the Asian persimmon, uh, which is the one you, you usually buy in the grocery store. That's the big one that looks like an like, like apple sized tree. Uh, this is in the ebony family and the the bark kind of makes you think of the ebony family. It's a little bit darker. You see that kind of darker ridge. Um, ironically, if you cut this tree down, the, the wood is, has nothing to do with ebony. The, uh, the color, it's just kind of a pale tan color. So, uh, well, then maybe don't cut the tree down, just enjoy the fruit. Um, the native versions of the fruit have these smaller fruits. They're about maybe one to one and a half inch. You really wanna wait for these to either get shriveled up a little bit or hit a frost before you eat them. Otherwise you get kind of a mouth of cotton balls feel to them, uh, but otherwise they're good, good eating and they're uh, really favored uh, wildlife fruit as well. Um, so we have a couple of these non-native ones in the county and they actually thrive pretty well here. There's some amazing ones along Oakland Street off of uh, Columbia Pike that somebody just keeps propping up this tree. I keep meaning to talk to this person. I really love to know how they, how, how much they treasure these trees. Um, clearly they do. Um, so how do you identify this? You've got this really blocky bark. Um, so not even more blocky than the previous one, the dogwood, which is maybe like a half an inch deep. These are like inch deep blocks on the native persimmon. Uh, the non-native one is a little bit harder to identify, but you usually see the giant fruit still hanging on to it later in the in the fall. And it's not that common, but I just wanted to note it. Uh, so you're not probably not going to see this around. Um, uh, but if you uh, you can usually tell by by either the fruit or um, it still has a little bit of that blocky feel to it. But the native one is much more common. You see the huge blocks. Um, and, and the remnant fruit even now in winter. 
All right, one more before we take a break. And uh, um, okay, uh, so this, I, I don't think I even need to teach this because if you can't identify an American beach, um, uh, I, I think you either don't know it <laughs> or, uh, or you're not paying attention. They're, uh, they're these smooth bark trees. They don't have uh, much of a sinewy look to them like the muscle wood does, although they sometimes have these stripes to them. Their buds are extremely sharp, like, like sometimes up to an inch long. You can really poke somebody with the buds. It's an alternate leaf um, plant. You can see the alternate arrangement here, alternate bud too are usually a very big tree, sometimes vandalized. People have carved things into it. The fruit um, can leave these husks behind. Uh, the nut is usually eaten by a squirrel or something else, rarely humans. But you've got a lot of identifying features here um, that uh, will, uh, will help you identify this. So Nora, if you don't mind, I'm going to take just a five minute break real quick and then we can continue. That's fine. That's right. fine. Are you going to leave your screen up? That's fine. Yeah, Go ahead and leave it up. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do have a volunteer who um, will be cutting out the five minutes in the middle, but I'd like to take this opportunity to ask the class, has anyone... Um, are you familiar with Zoom so that if one stops it at this point and then starts recording again, um, would we lose it because it's all in one meeting or can one do that? Does anyone know? Hey, Nora, this is Eileen. Yeah, you can stop it and it'll stop the recording. And then when he starts again, start it again and you'll just get two recordings. So you don't have to split it. Right, but it'd be two very separate recordings. It wouldn't all be together. Correct. Right, the same way. Okay, well, I'll just have the volunteer um, cut uh, the five minute together. talk Who's out in the middle. But you but can also, you can, you can also, well. go ahead. I'm sorry, you can also just pause the recording and then resume recording and it'll be one. Ah, oh, you're That's right. Great. I you see pause. 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 I'm yeah, going to hit. Pause. Yes. Yes. All right. We learned a new trick here, too. Um, uh, OK, uh, there's some questions in the chat um, about whether silver maple is the same as Norway maple. And I just realized I didn't include so, uh, Norway maple. So I'm going to add that the next time. I have this presentation. Thanks for pointing that out. That's Acer platinoides. And uh, that's um, not as easily identified as, uh, uh, or not as similar to some of the other Acers that we have in our native landscape. They actually don't really look as much like these, a little bit more like the, the box elder on the bottom right, but it's got much more regular stripey bark. So I don't have a picture of it, but I'll include it in a future presentation. Because even though it's an invasive non-native species, you might still see it in the landscape. So you want to be able to identify it. Um, and then there was a question about what does platinoides, acer platinoides uh, stand for? Well, that's uh, like a platinus, which a platinus is a sycamore. Um, so platinoides, like platinus. And then uh, here's, uh, there's <laughs> some real funny back and forth going on here because then you also have platinus acerifolia, which is um, a maple-like leaf for um, the sycamore. So it goes back around. So you've got a sycamore-like leaf maple and a maple-like leaf uh, sycamore, just to keep it confusing. And then there's also a sycamore maple, but that's not native here, so don't want to, or even planted here, so I don't want to make it even more confusing. Um, and another question is, um, is a uh, service berry usually multi-trunked? Yes, uh, most of the time it's, it's multi-trunked. Most of these smaller trees and, and shrub-like trees are, are multi-trunked. That's just the way 
that's just the way it is the way the way they grow they tend to be more shrubby and, and immediately branch at the base because they don't really have the need to go all the way to the top of the canopy so they can start working on their their expansion early on hey vincent yes. this is ramana um there are two other questions that um weren't answered. Um, when, one was a simple one, such as why don't people plant hickories? Because you mentioned people don't usually plant them. Yeah, I thought I answered that because it was too, uh, it had too much of a uh, taproot. It's hard to transplant that tree. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to get into a little bit. A little bit. It's, it's very hard to keep that taproot healthy and it needs that when it's very young. Uh, it develops a taproot very quickly to get to the the water table and uh, you uh, uh, that because it's hard to transplant it's hard to grow in the nursery so you usually have to have to plant it very small or do some really special work in the nursery which extra work costs extra money so people don't necessarily want to spend the money to grow larger hickories and then see them die or not have people buy them because they're not familiar with them too and did you see francis sword's question about Define large and small tree overstory slash understory. Yes, yeah, so yeah. Go ahead. I asked her to elaborate. I don't know. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, the larger tree. Those are those are tend to be the oaks, the maples, the sycamores, uh, trees that are over forty feet in maturity, and the smaller understory trees tend to be like the hornbeams, service berries dogwoods, red buds that don't tend to get much larger than 25 feet. So that's how I kind of separate those out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ash trees. Um, well, uh, you're going to see less and less of these, unfortunately, because they got, oh, sorry. They got attacked by emerald ash borer recently. And, um, but you may still see them in our natural environment because we still have them and we'll see them in in uh, Barcroft when we walk through there too. The uh, the tree is opposite, maple, ash, dogwood, horse chestnut. It's part of that group of, of trees. And it's got these kind of like horn-like branches that are really, really typical of ash trees that are really cool um, uh, and, and a really easy identifier. They usually have pretty large buds for an opposite uh, branched tree too because they contain an, a composite leaf there's a lot to their individual leaves um, and they have this kind of diamond like bark that's really visible here you see these diamonds in between the ridges of this bark you can even see it when they're later on it's like this opening and closing really cool tree but yeah it's it's in decline now because of Emerald ash borer, which killed billions of trees in in the uh, in uh, the Midwest, and and killed quite a few in our environment too. Because even in the, even if a tree is only one percent of your tree canopy, if you have three quarters of a million trees, that's that's uh, uh, still uh, seventy five hundred trees. Or sorry, yes, no. <laughs> 7500 trees almost 10000 trees of uh, uh that that have uh, that will be affected by something like this it was an amazing street tree uh, until it got kind of a, a eradicated by the emerald ash borer we still have a couple of trees left so a little bit less common but you'll still see them around and we have green and white ash and you really have to get down to the bud identification to distinguish these two um, but if you get to this this stage where you know that it's an ash you can use your identifier book and, and really get to the to the details um, uh, one of them has the bud uh, being hugged by the leaf scar and one where the bud is above the leaf scar so um, uh, but it, once you get to this stage you can you, you you can already start celebrating that you've gotten really far and then uh, you just have to pull out your identifier for those bud scars Ginkgo. So, um, Mariel, you tried and you got ahead of the game with this one earlier. I think it was you um, with these buds that stack. This is one of the coolest trees. Um, one, uh, often called a living fossil because there's not really anything. This is the only species in its um, in its in its group of trees. Um, Ginkgo biloba. That's the only one there is left in this whole group of Ginkgo ACA, I think. Um, or ginkgo alice, if you want, there's a cool 
I don't know if you can use that in Scrabble, but um, it's a cool word. Um, and the I identified as the most by this just these stacked buds that um, just keep stacking on top of each other. It's an extremely conservative tree. It, it really only sends out a, a twig when it really knows it wants to go that direction. So it, it, it spends like a couple of decades sometimes growing buds and I'm like, all right, this is the right place. And it finally sends out a twig on that place. So it's gonna have very conservative branching, very limited um, uh, structure to it because it, uh, I mean, it survived just um, millions of years of stress. And one of my favorite stories is that um, it's one of the only trees that survived the Hiroshima bombing, which is horrific, of course, but um, to see a tree grow and survive out of that is really impressive. And this is this species is the one that that survived that. So, but um, bud identification, honestly, that's the that's one of the best ways to look at it. The bark is also very somewhat distinctive, kind of this grayish bark with these like kind of tan rivers in between when it's older. When it's younger, it doesn't have as much cracking, but the older trees you can really identify very well that way. Honey locusts, we looked at this earlier um, in the presentation. These thorns are an obvious uh, giveaway, but so there are some thornless varieties um, that uh, have been coming out. Uh, so that might not be visible on the tree, but it's got these platy barks, bark going on. It usually holds on to its, its seeds throughout the, through, uh, throughout the winter too, and then drops them later on. Um, it's got kind of very kind of witchy look. Uh, I really like uh, how it how it looks like kind of like a like a fairy tale tree sometimes. Um, also, kind of like a it's it, this is what I call medium sized tree. It doesn't necessarily get to get to the oak or sycamore size, but it also isn't as small as a red bud or a dogwood. Um, and that's why it has kind of the features of both. It's got kind of like the indeterminate growth of um of the branches kind of going out very low on on its uh, on the tree um uh but it's it's got the the height of uh like a larger a larger tree up too these are great for for uh streetscapes because they don't necessarily mess with the surrounding buildings as much but and they also have a thinner foliage so if you have signage and uh, that uh and that can um, that can maybe shine through the the leaflets a little bit more. Crystal asks, um, how can you look at a tree or like a ginkgo and tell tell that it has conservative branching? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Let's take a look at this. So how how would you tell? So this is maybe not the greatest picture for that, but let me see if I have another picture of a different tree that could show that more. I'll show you the opposite. So this is this is a good example of the opposite of that. It's just branches everywhere. Just trying to optimize everything, trying out every angle, trying to catch some sun. Um, this is also a good example of the opposite of conservative branching, just like very opportunistic, just going wherever the sun might be. Sometimes it doesn't work out, sometimes it works out. Um, and the, the ginkgo will just slowly make a decision uh, about a twig, so it's it's going to be much more, I don't know, architectural, like more. It it seems it looks more designed, like the lines are more uh, stark, and um, the tree is taking less chances with its with its twigs, um, and that usually means there's a lot less branch, a lot fewer branches, um, and uh, the the branching is a lot less common than with some of these. Uh, some would call messier trees or more opportunistic trees. I hope that answered. Thanks, Crystal. All right, walnuts. There's the real witchy tree. I, I like this one a lot. Um, <clears throat> walnut trees have extremely dark wood. That doesn't necessarily mean the, 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 the bark is always as dark, but it tends to be darker than some other, other trees. It's got deep ridges on it too. Um, and um, I, I guess the only one you would confuse it with when it's younger is maybe the persimmon, um, but you can look around a walnut tree and basically see walnuts everywhere. Uh, the walnuts uh, often get abandoned because they're not, they're partially eaten already. And um, 
one thing that uh, is very typical of walnuts is that it tends to kill almost everything around it uh, plant-wise. And there are exceptions to this. There's some other, there are some plants that can handle walnuts just fine. They have a chemical called juglandone, uh, which which tends to kill things in the in the uh, in the soil, and people have actually synthesized this as an herbicide. Um, so you can see a kind of a bare ground underneath the tree. You've got this witchy look to the tree, and then you can see you can usually see walnuts still remaining on the tree, or you can see them on the ground. Um, and this is actually a tree you have to know how to do winter tree ID, even in the the kind of mid fall because it starts to lose its leaves in like September or October sometimes. So you kind of have to learn how to identify it by the bark and um, by the, uh, the the structure of it. So we have black walnuts um, and we have uh, English walnut and we have uh, Turkish walnut, I think. Cinerate. No, cinerate is butternut, sorry. This is the butternut, which is a type of walnut as well. So black walnut is our native walnut. Uh, it's very astringent. Uh, not everybody loves the flavor, but it's very like a very strong flavor. Uh, the English walnut is the one you commonly see in the store. Um, not very commonly planted, but there's a couple at Fort C.F. Smith. And then butternuts are very rare, but we do have some in the county um, that are uh, look almost exactly like black walnuts, except the the um, seed or the nut has a point at the end, as, a, as opposed to these that are rounded. And uh, those are endangered in a lot of places here. They're just kind of rare. Sweet gum. We talked about this a little bit already, and this is luckily uh, one of the more easy identifier, easier identifier. You, uh, uh, more easily identified trees. Um, you might remember them with their like annoying spike balls all over the place. But if you don't have that, if somebody swept them up, you can usually see a spongy bark or when it's younger, that warty bark that we talked about that's similar to the hackberry. And then I, keep talk I kept talking about the huge buds that they have. They're usually big, sticky, kind of shiny bud at the end of the twig. Um, that's a real good identifier for this tree. Another one that's, uh, that you'll see more on younger trees is these wings. Um, uh, these, are, these are really cool. They're, they're very similar to what you see on a winged burning bush, but they have these kind of quirky wings that are really neat, um, that actually are the same structure that the warts come from, but uh, a different way of expressing it and uh, maybe a good defensive mechanism. Uh, probably harder to chomp on this twig if it has things like that, just like a, a thorn would. Now, a location-based identifier is <laughs> that I like to use as a recently destroyed sidewalk. Um, sweet gums just will just destroy a sidewalk if they're planted in too small of a space. Their roots are so powerful and will just kick up a sidewalk, destroy um, water lines if they have a leak in them. And that can be very destructive. So we're a little bit hesitant to plant them sometimes, especially in small tree pits. But you'll see them around the county or in, in uh, natural areas too. Uh, they do definitely have, have a great value and they, they become really beautiful trees. Some of the my most favorite fall color comes from sweet gum. So with some of the headache comes a beauty too. Um, I have a question from Richard. Why are butternut trees rare here? Some trees are just um, not as happy with the uh, ecosystem here. So they're just at the edge of their range. Um, just like ash trees aren't as common here, they, they tend to prefer the colder areas. Um, so that's, that's why um, certain trees are more or, or less common here. Uh, they, butternut trees are more common farther north, I believe. I'll have to check the range. Uh, they're endangered in, in Canada, I believe. So I know they live up to the up to Toronto at least. <clears throat> All right. So this one's probably one that kind of th this one's one that tricked people earlier because it has this duck bill bud, and so does the the uh, the pawpaw. But the pawpaw has a fuzzy duck bill bud, and the tulip tree has a smooth duck bill bud. So that's a good identifier when you're looking at it. But honestly, um, the one identifier I use in the winter is the remnant seeds. 
So these seeds, you can see them in any uh, tulip tree. They're all the way in the top of the canopy and they just stay around until the very first day of spring. You see this bud ready to pop and the seeds are still on here. And that's really just to, the key identifier. But if, if you don't wanna use that or if you're not looking, just looking for other identifying features, an extremely tall tree, extremely straight trunked and it's got these ridged bark over here. And then when they get older, you can kind of see this over here. They start to lose that ridging kind of at the base of the tree. So uh, the much older trees start to have newer identifying features too. Romana, that's a good description. The seeds look like candelabras. That's a, I like that. Um, and if you call a tulip tree a tulip poplar around me, I might get annoyed. It is not a poplar at all. So try to get that out of your mind. The reason people call it a poplar is because uh, Europeans, and I can say that because I'm from Europe, uh, <laughs> didn't know any better and just called anything that looked straight a poplar. And that uh, the tulip tree, which is a magnolia, nowhere related to uh, poplars, got thrown into that because it's a very straight tree. Uh, a tulip tree is a good descriptor. One place where that can be confusing somewhere in uh, some Californians have mentioned to me that there's a tulip magnolia that they call a tulip tree out west, but we don't live in California, so call it a tulip tree. And there's only one common species. There's a there's a species of tulip tree out in China, but I haven't seen it planted around here. All right. Speaking of magnolia, uh, and I separated these up a little bit. Um, the tulip tree is in the magnolia family, but not in the magnolia genus. Um, this is a group of native and non-native species, um, often ornament, planted for their ornaments, but uh, the sweet bay magnolia, for example, Virginiana, is a common, or is a very important tree to our rare, um, um, our rare barcroft bog. So that's a, uh, a, a very unusual um, uh, bog that we have, a magnolia bog that we have in Arlington County, where you can find these uh, bay magnolia or magnolia virginiana. But you're also going to see, and uh, this, describing deciduous uh, magnolias here, but I'll, I'll get into the, the southern magnolia a little bit too. Um, with magnolias, you're going to get this smooth bark, not, not dissimilar from uh, service berry, but not with stretch marks usually. Usually it has these little lenticels in them, usually gray, sometimes a little like lighter brown color. It's got these fuzzy buds, and especially right now, go look at a magnolia or go find one. They're the fuzziest thing to touch. It's like like the, the softest cat you've ever pet. Um, and it's just really fun to fun to touch, and that, uh, it's a good identifying feature because nothing is this fuzzy, and then you can probably tell that it's a, that it's a magnolia. Um, some of the the ones that we have that are non-native, uh, the star magnolia stellata, and the saucer magnolia are very common around here. People planted them all over the place. They flower before their leaves come out, so it's just an explosion of color, and they're really cool. And you'll see them probably popping up in months from now. Then you have the cucumber magnolia, which has gigantic leaves, like tobacco leaf-sized leaves that are, this is a little bit less common, but you can see it in some of our forests, uh, usually planted actually in our forest or, or escaped, but it's, it's from like 100 miles from here. So to call it invasive is a little bit of a stretch. Um, so most of these, so it's from small, the star magnolia is almost a shrub to medium-sized trees, uh, like the two, Cucumber magnolia can be a larger to medium sized tree. So, fuzzy buds, usually these weird um, fruit structures. It's one of the it's it's one of the earliest groups of flowering trees, so it had to develop kind of unusual uh, structures compared to other trees. It was trying out different things. It's beetle pollinated, um, so not a bee pollinated because they weren't around when this tree evolved. Uh, so it's got giant flowers because it had to it had to really uh, advertise itself to the surrounding environments like it's the newest thing in town it's flowering trees um, and we uh, and that, that's how it got it survived through millions of years of, of evolution um, <clears throat> by continuing to advertise and continuing to keep those beetles interested 
but that doesn't help you with tree identification in winter. But these remnant fruits that are kind of like weird little uh, dried up, what do you, how would you describe this? Um, I don't know. Like uh, I can think of some uncharitable things to compare it to, but I'm trying to think of like a like an earring almost. <laughs> an amulet. Know. An amulet. There you go. There we go. Like, yeah, a cluster of fruits is a good way of describing it. Yeah. Yeah, you should. You can probably use it in dark magic somewhere. All right. Um, and then oh, the uh, the evergreen magnolia, the southern magnolia is evergreen. So I'm not going to talk about it because you can identify it by its leaves. It's got huge, shiny leaves. Um, and uh, those should be easier to identify. All right. Um, uh, Crystal said they look like bizarro pine cones. I like that. Uh, and and they're probably more related to pine cones um, than any other flowering tree because they were the first flowering tree. So they had to split off from, from uh, being a, a gymnosperm or a non-flowering tree like the pines. So it's pro it probably had to use some existing ideas. You know how like the beetles stole ideas, well, the magnolia stole ideas from the from the pine trees and came up with a slightly altered version of, of, uh, of, of what they had going for it. So yeah, that's a good comparison. And it really helps you think about these in an evolutionary context. All right, Don Redwood, this is a cool one because this is probably, I think this might be the one of the few um, uh, gymnosperms in this presentation, which is uh, what I was just, was just talking about. Um, and Romana, I'll get to your question. Um, the uh, Don Redwood is a deciduous conifer. So this has little cones, you see them at the bottom. Um, it's this particular species is from uh, China and it's uh, almost, in, it's endangered in its natural habitat, but planted fairly commonly especially in the 50s and 60s, it was planted all over this region for some reason. And they have this really cool flame-shaped form if it's grown in the open. Uh, really cool to see. It's got kind of flaky bark the bottom right, you can see that, but honestly, the form should give it away for, for you. Uh, the form will give it away. It's a deciduous conifer. So there's only a handful of deciduous conifers in the world, really. Um, and I'll get to another one, the bald cypress, and then you have the larch and a couple other things like the tamarack, which are not common around here. You really, with a deciduous conifer, you just have two things to pick from in Arlington. It's this Don Redwood or uh, bald cypress. And this form, this really straight, straight flame-like form comes from it being oppositely arranged. Uh, it's not part of this mad cap horse because mad cap horse is a little bit... Uh, um, I don't know, a flowering tree focus, let's, let's put it that way. Um, uh, but it should also include the dawn. So maybe the, the, the dawn horse, mad, mad dawn horse might be better because honeysuckle is not really a tree. Um, it, I'll, I'll work on that as we go. <laughs> Madam cap horse, there we go, perfect. <laughs> um, maple ash, dogwood. Meta Sequoia, yeah, I don't know. We, we'll keep working on, let's workshop it. I'm just kidding. Well, I, but if you send, send me any ideas, I'll, I'll bring it back in there into this presentation. Um, the fruit are like little cones, if you really haven't figured it out from this, this shape uh, and the, the deciduous conifer component. And then you have this bark and it gets extremely tall. There are hundreds of feet tall in maturity. So really cool tree. All right, um, I got a question from Romana before I go into mulberry. So are you uh, saying, she, she was asking, are you saying pine trees are beetle pollinated? No, magnolias are beetle pollinated. And that was the first time it was a tree that used a different uh, organism to spread its, uh, uh, its genetic material in that way. Uh, pines and several other types of trees, not just uh, gymnosperms are wind pollinated. Um, they have those little like dangling uh, catkins and they just get blown in the wind and the, the, uh, the pollen gets spread that way. Gets straight into your nose too. 
Um, okay. Uh, mulberry, a messy tree. We have a native and a non-native. We have a non-native invasive, the white mulberry. And we have a native, the red mulberry. Um, they're fairly similar looking, so they're hard to tell apart, especially in the winter. But getting to, like I said, getting to genus level is great. Um, one thing I look for most of the time is this orange bark that, that uh, even in older trees, you'll see it kind of popping up between the ridges. With younger trees, you'll definitely see it here. Um, if you see roots, they'll definitely be orange, like kind of bright orange when they're sticking out. Um, that's a very messy looking tree here again, the opposite of conservative, kind of like going wherever it can possibly grow. Um, uh, the non-native one tends to grow in similar places that the tree of heaven grows. So like uh, alleys and unmaintained rights of way that have been ignored. Um, <clears throat> and what you can really see in some of these older trees is these deep ridges that you uh, they're almost uh, almost as deep as uh, as like a walnut or another one that i've described these can be like two inches deep sometimes and kind of messy in their appearance on the on the bark too so um, the the non-native one is a very invasive species if you ever want to learn like a wacky story you can look up the mulberry craze people tried like just like the tulip bulb crisis in, in the netherlands um, tried buying uh, mulberries like nuts in the 1800s because it was all the rage to buy a mulberry and support support the silk industry. Uh, well, uh, needless to say, the mulberry did fine, but the silk industry in the United States never really took off. Um, and it's cross uh, breeding with our red mulberry, making the red mulberry less and less common, which is unfortunate. So kind of a medium to large tree, identifying features is orange bark, messy habit, uneven form, and then the deep ridges. Tupelo. This is my favorite tree, and this is one of those answers uh, that only a forester would give. What is your favorite tree? Because there's, there's nothing really like obviously remarkable about it, aside from the fall color, which I'm not really talking about here. But it's got this blocky bark. And this kind of like weird feature to its uh, twigs that doesn't seem to affect its structure for some reason, kind of wavy twigs. Um, one of the, uh, the uh, females of the, of the species have these fruits. Um, and uh, thanks, Romana. Yeah, Alonzo said it's his favorite tree too. And one of the way I describe it in the landscape is that it always looks like somebody sat on the top. Even with the older trees, it's like, what is going on over here? Why does it not keep going? And it looks like a giant sat on top of this tree. Even with the younger trees, it'll just look like it's got kind of a flat top always when, it, when it's growing and it grows so slowly. Um, but it grows very slowly, but very effectively because the oldest broadleaf tree on the Eastern seaboard, no, yes. Um, uh, is a is a black gum or a black tupelo, um, and it's it's like almost seven hundred years old, and it's not very large. It just grows extremely slowly, and and grows until and and and, and works with all the uh, all the things that people throw at it. Uh, Kelly, that old tree is somewhere in New York State, I think. Uh, you might have to look up like oldest black to below, but they did a, a very careful coring of it and found out it's very old. Um, so yeah, those are the identifying features. The, the blocky bark, somebody sat on it. Sometimes you'll see the fruit, but it's only in the female. This is a uh, monoecious tree that doesn't, uh, that has two genders, so different trees on, on different trees. And then the, the zigzag bark. This is also one of those trees where you're like, I don't know, I, I give up. I don't know what the tree is anymore. Maybe it's a Tupelo because it's not that easy to identify sometimes. Um, it's, a, it's also alternate, so not part of that madcap, madam, madcap red horse. All right, hop horn beam. This one is one of my favorite smaller trees too. Um, so hop horn beam is not a horn beam. 
So confusing again, I'm sorry about that. But we have Astraea virginiana as a native tree. And it's honestly, that's it. the identifying feature here is just that it looks like it's stripping off its bark left and right. Not like a sycamore in big plates or like a, like a hickory, like that really shaggy hickory way, but in these thin strips. And honestly, that's, that's all you need with this particular species because there's almost nothing that does this. The close, thin strips of bark that, that can uh, that, that come off of these. And it's a very small understory, small to medium understory tree. So you're not going to see giant trees of this, like the hickory you might see out, out in the field. Not as common, but you'll see it on like along the Potomac or in, in the understory. And we we're trying to get some to survive in front of the county headquarters as well. Sycamore, um, like I say, do I really need to tell you what to look for? <laughs> we have two commonly planted ones, the, the native one, the American sycamore, Occidentalis, and then X acerifolia, which is also known as X hispanica, which is the London plane tree, which is a very common um, uh, landscape tree, so like a street tree. Um, and it's honestly the difference is uh, you've got one fruit in the in the, the sequence. If it's only one fruit that's remaining, it's the American sycamore. If it's multiple up to five, it's the uh, the plane tree or very rarely the oriental um, plane tree, which uh, they need to change the name of. But um, <clears throat> they uh, th those are the, the ones you'll see around here. I mean, if you have a hard time identifying this, then we might have to start at a different scale for this <laughs> this presentation. But uh, we've got this uh, flaking bark, um, white, almost like ghosts right now in the in the landscape. And the reason for that is um, it's using this as a sunscreen. So these trees are very common along stream sides, and it slowly darkens throughout the year and then flakes off the bark. Um, so it's like basically like a temporary sunscreen, like we would use and we would wash it off and this tree does that too. So an unusual adaptation, but they're so exposed to the sun along these streams and also along streets where they do really well, um, that they, this is a great adaptation. All right, cherries. Um, well, uh, what else can I say about cherries? But in the winter, they might actually be harder to, to identify than, uh, than some of the other trees. The, the most obvious thing you can sometimes see, and this is not necessarily unique to cherries, but they have these very obvious lenticels, these little dots. So the ones that are a little bit older, the lenticels are a little bit more stretched out, sometimes kind of orangey. Oh, sorry. Um, my mouse is acting up for some reason. Okay, um, sorry about that. Um, and when they're younger, you have less lenticels on these, or uh, some of these species might have a very smooth kind of dark bark with the very obvious lenticels. And when they get older, almost all of the species, even the, the Japanese cherries get more flakes. You can start seeing in, the, seeing in, the, in here. Um, and the black cherry, our native species, the Prunus serotina, will turn into this like, black, um, um, like burnt potato chip description is a, is a really good description I've seen. Um, and that's an easy identifier for a black cherry, an old black cherry. The, the non-native uh, Japanese or Korean cherries are usually um, much smaller. They stay at kind of the size you see around the Jefferson Memorial or some other areas around, around the region. Um, and the, but the black cherry is the one that gets a little bit larger, large to medium size. It can be confused with like a, a black birch or a sweet birch. Those are so rare that most of the time, if you see something like this, you really have to identify it by the lenticels. You're probably looking at a cherry. So we've got the black cherry. Um, we've got cirillata, which is uh, the, Oh, not the Okama cherry. Okama cherry. This is the Kwanzaa cherry, which is my, my favorite. It's got those fluffy flowers. Well, my favorite um, um, Asian cherry, like ornamental cherry. Um, the Yoshino cherry, which is the common one around the, um, the reservoir. And then in camp, which is the uh, Okame cherry, which is the first flowering uh, non-native cherry, the pink one that you might see around. 
pairs. Um, so the pair that is common here, I wish it wasn't very common, which is the calorie pair, um, <clears throat> which is a, a tree that was grown like it was seen as a magic tree back in the 80s, kind of a medium sized tree, uh, has beautiful flowers, has a uh, um, beautiful fall color, but and it has this kind of ridgy bark. And then suddenly people started figuring out that, um, and you can kind of see it on the trees at the bottom, that these branch connections on the trees were very weak and the trees would just drop branches or entire trees without much notice, even in like light wind storms or small snowstorms. Um, and they just became more of a hazard than a, than a benefit. And then they became invasive too. Uh, and one of the, uh, cultivars Bradford started crossbreeding with a cultivar Cleveland Select and a couple of other cultivars to create invasive versions of this tree. So no thank you, we do not plant these anymore. You might still be able to get them in nurseries because if it sells, it sells. Um, but these are bad trees, these calorie pears. That doesn't mean we've started mass removing them quite yet because in some places they do still provide some great shade and, and color, um, but we will not replace them with calorie pairs. So how do you identify them? Well, they're, uh, they've got this uh, kind of dark, ridgy bark. Um, they've got a messy habit. Uh, they're usually, they've got included bark, which is this like tight connection inside of the bark. You'll probably see that when we, um, when you go through the structural pruning class, or you might have already done that. Um, and you might see this remnant fruit on the on the calorie pair. Now, there are also much less common, uh, the common pair, which is what you would get in the store or the Asian pair also available in stores. And I've seen those grown here and there. Uh, you, they're fairly uncommon in Arlington County. Um, so you're not likely to find those, but they have a similar kind of looking dark bark, but they tend to be much smaller, the, uh, the fruiting pairs. I have some questions. Uh, Emily asked, is the Caloriana pear? Yeah, that's a, Bradford is a variety of calorie pear. So what you'll see is Pyrus, Caloriana, and then you'll see Bradford in quotes. Um, Richard, you asked, is hop hornbeam used as a tree line to define a property line? Uh, no, that's the, that's the European hornbeam. That's like that hedge that I was describing with the European hornbeam. Um, and Nora asked, are there native pears? Uh, no, there are not, as far as I know, any native pears around here. But the Asian pear does grow really well. And I actually was talking to uh, the foresters in my unit today about including that in our tree canopy list um, have to allow people to plant them for tree canopy on their properties. Because uh, the, the edible pears are not known to be invasive. So why not allow people to use them? One other thing that you might see, but it's not always present, is this spine. And that's very common in rose family species, which the pear is part of. It's these like sharp thorns. You'll see these in apples as well, or hawthorns or uh, crab apples. Great questions, guys. All right, let me check my time. I think I'm getting to the end of these. This, uh, we're already at Q, so that's usually near the end. So. Um, I've split oaks into two groups. Oaks are, are uh, some of the biggest part of our canopy and uh, are separated up into white oaks and red oaks. The difference between white oaks and red oaks is more easily seen in, in the leaves in that white oaks have rounded leaf margins and don't have a bristle at the end. And red oaks have that bristle and are more pointy. So scarlet oaks, red oaks, uh, scarlet oak, oaks, northern red oaks, uh, pin oaks, willow oaks, they all have a bristle at the end of their leaf, and white oaks do not. Well, how do you identify them in the, in the winter? Well, I talked about these, um, these bud clusters at the end of the twig. That's, and then you're already in the oak group, um, most likely. Uh, you might see the acorns laying around. And then they all have, the white oaks tend to all have this very silvery looking bark, which is pretty unique of them. And I mean, beaches have silvery looking bark, but you wouldn't confuse a beach for most anything. Uh, and you might, and the only other one you might confuse it with is maybe a silver maple, but that's opposite. And 
oaks are alternate. So you should have already figured out, is it alternate or opposite? Well, it's alternate, then maybe it could be an oak. If it's opposite, it's never going to be an oak. So gray silver bark, deep ridges, ridges in the chestnut oak. So that's this one. Um, and our more strips or like flakes almost in the white oak. That's Alba, chestnut oak is Montana. Um, the uh, swamp white oak might look more like this with these uh, plates. Uh, that's bicolor. And Stellatus post oak that looks very similar to a white oak. So uh, there's no almost no difference in the in the species. In the winter, it's going to be hard to tell a white oak from a post oak. So you might have to just accept that you've gotten arrived at genus level. But these deep ridges in this, um, along with the acorns and the buds, that's probably going to be a, a chestnut oak. Um, Martha asked, is there a black oak? Yeah, black oaks are a red oak. So um, uh, I will get to those next. So these are much more common in natural areas, but people do plant them every once in a while. Red oaks. All right, scarlet oak, southern red oak, pin oak, willow oak, northern red oak, and black oak. You got ahead of us, Martha. Thank you. Um, so these tend to be a little bit darker in, in their bark. You can kind of look back and forth here. Let me do that. A little bit darker in their appearance with their bark. They tend to, the the red the northern red oak has this cool thing where it looks like they almost have ski slope stripes going up and down the tree. That's a really good identifier for another northern red oak. Uh, obviously, still the clustered buds. Um, the willow oaks uh, are, are very common as street trees. Pin oaks are common as street trees. They're very resilient. Um, and some trees, um, and we talked about this before we started recording, we, we talked about marcescence. And marcescence is when trees have their leaves stay on the tree um, for part of the winter or all of the winter and then lose them and grow a new crop. And the science seems to be all over the place about why that is. There's a couple of reasons. Either uh, it's 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 hard, or it makes their twigs less palatable if there's dry leaves on it, or there might be a reason where the um, the leaves protect the bark from from wind. Although with oak trees, the bark is very thick. So yeah, once again, clustered buds, uh, darker bark, um, sometimes smaller acorns, except for the red oak, northern red oak. Um, and sometimes they have these little stripes on them. This is a pin oak acorn over here. All right, sumac, this is a little bit less common. Um, oh, Francis, you're asking about a chinkapin oak. Yeah, you're getting into some of the more unusual species that you're probably not going to encounter. But yes, chinkapin oak is a type of white oak that you might encounter in the uh, in the forest. Uh, I think it is a type of white oak. That's how, how rarely I, I see it. Um, uh, but if you if you run across something you can't get to the identification, you might be looking at a chinkapin oak. So. There might be other things outside of this presentation, but I'm trying to give you all the, the major ones, but thank you. Thank you for that question. That is an un, unusual one, but shows you're paying attention. <laughs> um, the uh, sumac is uh, more of a shrub to a small tree, uh, but it's uh, very easily identified by having this very fuzzy twigs. Uh, not just the buds, the buds are fuzzy too, but they're fuzzy twigs. And they have this remnant fruit that stays around at the end of their branches, which have these berries on them. It's related um, to uh, poison ivy. Uh, that doesn't mean that you'll get a reaction from touching them or consuming the fruit or anything like that, because you can make a tea out of the fruit. But people who are very sensitive have to watch out because it is still related just like people might have uh, sensitivity to, to things like mangoes or cashews, which are in the same family. Uh, very fuzzy twigs, like I said, the, the bark is a little bit similar to Alanthus, the, um, the tree of heaven. Um, and it's also got um, decent sized buds, but they're not nearly as big as those tree of heaven, the giant like inch long buds. Um, our common ones are uh, staghorn, which you see over here, and the, uh, I think the, uh, 
shoot uh, the smooth or shining, shining uh, sumac, which have uh, kind of a weird little bridge to their um, leaflets. But if you don't have leaves to look at, uh, they have a much smaller fruit, almost like a quarter the size of the staghorn sumac. These fruit are usually what can tell you, and then the fuzzy, fuzzy twigs can get it to get, get you pretty close. Black locust. Um, this is not like the very similar to the the honey locust, but slightly different. Doesn't have those plated um, uh, bark, but it has more uh, like deeply furrowed and uh, like splitting bark over here. You can see that splitting going on. Uh, also retains its seeds. Um, and then it has much smaller spines than uh, the black locust does. And you might not even see these, but the bark is a good identifier. And it's also got kind of a witchy uh, look to it. It can grow. So this is a good example of an aggressive native species that can grow alongside tree of heaven and uh, white mulberry and really uh, take over some of these less managed places. That also makes it a really great species for something like uh, mine reclamation uh, and uh, uh, pl restoring places that have been really destroyed because it can live on really poor soils. So a good identifier for like, hey, this is just a crappy site. It might be a great place for a black locust. So that might limit your ID when you're looking at it. Um, so deeply ridged bark uh, retains the beans, has very uneven form. Uh, this is probably the nicest looking black locust over here. And then it might have these spines and live in invaded habitats. Romana asked, why are oaks accused of being promiscuous? Well, that's a, a saucy question, but um, particularly red oaks uh, are known to crossbreed and create unusual hybrids that are hard to identify. So they're constantly hybridizing. And that's what makes identification of oaks uh, a little bit difficult. So they, they get around a lot. Let's just put it that way. And they're wind pollinated, so they need a lot less help from animals to get around uh, with their pollen and it can fly all over the place. You get some wacky hybrids. Willow, you might be familiar with the weeping willow, not the whomping willow, the weeping willow, which is Salix babylonica. Um, and that's very easy to identify in the, in the winter with this, this kind of weeping habit. And you, you might think this has leaves on it, but these are actually tiny twigs that are hanging off of the side of this tree uh, that it retains throughout the winter. Um, it's, a, it's a very um, often a multi-trunk tree. This is kind of an exception, kind of like this. Uh, the native um, Salix nigra um, has been used for like a million medical applications, including acne cream to headache uh, treatment. But how you identify it is it has these really deep furrows in it, kind of platy bark furrowed, platy bark, usually multi-stemmed. Uh, and even the native one has tons of twigs all over the tree. So it's pretty easy to identify. And the native one is usually planted along stream sides, not in people's front yards. And then the uh, weeping willow, if you have a hard time identifying with that. Uh, you might have to think about this class again. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, the weeping willow is pretty easy to identify with this very um, weeping habit. Now, weeping trees are, uh, that, that's a, a mutation that usually means that the wood is weaker. So it's not necessarily good for the tree, but it can create a really dramatic look to a tree. There are also weeping cherries, weeping birches, and other things they're not going to retain these twigs all over the tree that you can see here in this frosted image. Bald cypress, um, this is a non uh, deciduous conifer again, like the Don Redwood. And honestly, the only big difference is that it's alternate, not opposite. So it's very similar to the Don Redwood, loses its needles. It's alternately branched, and you can see that a little bit. It's a little bit more irregular than that flame shape of the Don Redwood. This is native to the United States and one of the oldest living trees on the eastern seaboard. Um, we've got the, on, in the west, we have the um, uh, Pinus longeva, which is the, uh, shoot, what's that pine? <laughs> uh, bristlecone pine. 
which is uh, the oldest living tree in, in the world. But on the East Coast, we've got some 2,000, 2,500 year old bald cypress in the South. These are really cool. And you will see these fairly straight trees. There's one in front of the Trade Center where my office is. Very straight looking trees, just like a pine would grow. And alternate branching, it's a deciduous conifer. So you might see some leftover needles here and there. And you might see this fruit that it has kind of like little nobules. Um, in a natural habitat, you might see the knees. And I, I should add a picture of that. Um, that uh, particularly near streams that, uh, that pop up near the tree in the water or near the water um, that are, people aren't entirely sure what they're for, either for gas exchange or stability. Not as tall as a Don Redwood, doesn't grow to hundreds of feet, but it can get pretty tall. All right, lindens, um, we're almost at the end over here. The bark is very similar to Fraxinus, which is the ash. We have American linden, little leaf linden and uh, silver linden um, <clears throat> that have kind of an, a diamond bark in it, but the ash is opposite and the linden is alternate. So you can see the alternate arrangement. And it's got these little cute little Muppet buds. And they're really just like tiny little snails almost. Um, that's a really good way to identify them, just this round little snail-like buds that you can see in the, in the winter on these almost red twigs. But it's an alternate tree, so it's not a red maple, which would have the red twigs. Um, and, it's not, and it's not an ash, so even though it has these diamond bark, it is alternately arranged. So it's a, a linden. A uh, fairly common street tree in Fairlington and South Arlington. Um, it tends to be a little bit smaller, on the smaller side of large trees, basically. Um, tends to get to like 60, 70 feet maximum, not, not the largest out there. All right, going the wrong way. All right, elms, uh, these are very varied. Our um, American elm is a very iconic street tree and usually with this vase shape to it. Um, very great for like if you want to plant something that grows up and then grows out so it shades the street but you can still drive underneath it. Um, very common in the if you want to see a ton of them just go to the National Mall pretty much every tree on the National Mall is an American elm. Uh, they've got these round little hat shaped buds that are very close to the twig. Um, the bark can be so I've got a couple of species here the American is a lighter bark that's kind of crisscrossy like this. The Siberian, Siberian, which is Pumala, which is this one, it's very dark, almost black. Sometimes it has um, this, uh, uh, like a, 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 a mold growth near some of the, the branch unions, which is very common, but it's like an almost black looking elm. This is one of our non-native invasive ones. And here we've got another camo one, that's the Chinese elm the parvifolia, almost parvifolia, which is uh, used to be more of a common street tree, but it's now on our invasive plant list as well. This camo identification is pretty easy to identify because it's never white like a sycamore. It's always tan underneath and they're, they're smaller. And I mean, a sycamore just got those huge plates that fall off and Chinese elm tends to hold on to its uh, bark. What I mean with bacterial wet wood is this basically, this, this color is that uh, can be an identifying feature for an elm. All right. Oh, I got through all of the major ones. There are other trees that are planted around things like zelkovas, um, uh, a, the uh, Japanese pagoda tree and things like that, but they're much less common than what, what I showed in this. Um, so I use every tool for uh, identifying trees as well. So I gave you all the tools you can use with your eyes and just some field guides. But these days you can use iNaturalist, try to use leaf snap is an older, older tool that has amazing pictures of leaves and bark. So I like using that just to, to browse through it for uh, identifying ideas. Um, the guides I've suggested, like City of Trees with pictures and drawings, but also the Audubon guide. Use the Google image search or the Bing image search or anything like that that you might use or 
um, to search for pictures and with descriptions. It's like, oh, show me all the flaky bark pictures. And you might be able to identify a tree just by searching and clicking through things. Talk to your friends, uh, your tree stewards, master naturalists, some master gardeners are excellent tree identifiers too. And then online tree nerd groups, of course. Um, they are often more than eager to show their skills. Um, the, news, the news group or newsletters and uh, boards and places like that, the capital naturalist can be used for that too. So I'll leave my... Um, a contact information here, but I have one question from Francis, and then I can open it up to more broad questions. Uh, Francis, you asked, how much do you rely on the overall shape of the tree for ID? It depends if I can see the overall shape of the tree. So if it's grown in an open field or along a street, it's much easier to rely on that. And you can easily identify things like uh, elms and um, certain types of oaks. Uh, just by driving around, by just looking at the shape, not even looking at the bark or the buds. And that's not me showing off. You just kind of get used to it after looking at a couple of dozen of the same species, what the form will be. All right. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you want to turn it over. I'll, I'll turn it over to Nora, but if you want to let people ask random questions. It is nine o'clock, but I'm happy to stay a little longer for any other questions on tree ID or other tree things. Yeah, um, okay. Well, the, um, you know, if anyone needs to get off, that's fine because this is recorded and it'll be up in two days or so. But um, does anyone have any, um, questions or comments you'd like to unmute yourself and ask, um, oh, and ask Vincent. And let me just say that also, you'll learn a lot about trees with informal tree walks. When you get the list of your fellow trainees, just getting in touch with people and three of you taking a walk together in a park can be really, um, really useful. Nice. I, I see some questions in the chat, so I can answer those. Okay. Uh, uh, so Amy, you're, uh, I'll start with um, Crystal actually. What are your favorite sites for tree viewing in the area? Uh, National Arboretum is exceptional to look at pretty much all the types of trees you can uh, find, but if you're looking in, in Arlington County, I find that uh, walk, taking a walk along um, uh, the Four Mile Run Trail, going from Barcroft through Glen Carlin, going up through Bon Air and Bluemont, you're going to see pretty much everything. You're going to see 80% of this list from dry sites to wet sites to cultivated sites underneath power lines and things like that. And you're going to find the wackiest things because people have planted things like jujubes and in, in Bonaire Memorial Garden and places and things like that. Uh, and some of them are even tagged like the Bonaire Garden. We have uh, tags on our trees and then uh, you'll go through forests and more cultivated spaces. And that's a great place to go. If you are looking for a, a place closer to home, if you're in Arlington to view some blooming cherries, um, there's some places in, uh, in Boston that have some um, uh, plazas that are just full of uh, Japanese cherries that are great to go to if you don't want to go downtown to go to uh, the Jefferson Memorial. Um, Mariel asked if there are any other tree ID guides. Uh, at this point, I'm just relying on the internet, honestly. Uh, but if I do need to pull out a tree ID guide, it's honestly just a Peterson uh, Audubon guide, but the City of Trees one is the most specific to this area. There is also a Trees of North America photo guide, and I don't think it's available anymore, but you might be able to see it and find it in libraries from other people. Don Walsh actually gave me that copy of uh, the Trees of North America, which I still use. It has some amazing pictures of leaves. Um, okay, aside from optional, um, options of the U.S. National and State Arboretums, other places you'd recommend for looking at trees that are labeled. Uh, I mentioned the, the Bon Air Garden 
Um, trying to think of other places with labels. Well, trees. now we've got Green Springs Garden in yeah. Fairfax. Yeah. And the other Fairfax Park that they just opened that's... Uh, not meadow lark, right? Meadow, yeah, yeah, meadow lark. It's well, it's got a lot of trees that are labeled, which yep. is useful. Yeah. Uh Romana, you asked about can you tell me about the old growth forest at Glen Carlin? I can. This is one of our two old growth forests in Arlington County, uh Glen Carlin Park near the shelter. Uh, very close to the bridge over Four Mile Run with uh, the Dovino D Trail, we have a, a forest that has no record of being uh, disturbed in history. Um, uh, so that means that it might have been cut, but there's no clear record of that. Um, we have some remnant chestnuts in there, some mountain laurel, and some very unique species in there. Really cool to visit. Not very large. If you look up Glen Carlin Old Growth Forest, you can find where to find these uh, this little patch of forest. The other area is right behind the um, the the Lee Custis Mansion in the Arlington Cemetery. It's a little bit harder to get to, but that is also an old growth forest. Um, recommended sites in Alexandria. I don't cross that border. Come on, no, I'm just kidding. Um, the, uh, the, there's a national cemetery in Alexandria, which has some amazing trees in it. Um, uh, the, the other co-champion dwarf hackberry, I think the former champion American holly is still there and some amazing things like Osage orange over there. So I like going to that as well as, oh, uh, there's a fort and the name Fort Hunt, maybe no. Uh, the name oh, escapes. Fort me. Ward. Fort Ward, yeah. Fort Ward, and that's where one of the um, tree walks with Andrew Benjamin is happening. Okay, well then you get to visit yeah. that. Great. Right, and also in Alexandria, there's um, Jerome Buddy Ford mm. Nature Center, the yep. Dora Kelly Nature Park and the Winkler Botanical Preserve. Yeah, I used to do a, uh, I'd like to do this again, but before uh, the pandemic, I was doing uh, regular champion tree bike rides, including one in Alexandria, which started at the Nature Center and went through that natural area. That's a, that's a beautiful place, actually. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to email me. I don't love phone calls, but you can also call me. It just will take a little bit longer for me to get back to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Vincent. And I'm sure we will, um, we will be seeing you again, hopefully in person as well as Zoom. And Great. I will stop the recording now.